Am I still getting an audio, Lloyd? Yep, you're good. Okay, great. Uh, so I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak tonight. I want to thank all of you for coming. I know there's a debate tonight and probably many of you like myself are completely undecided as to who you're going to vote for. I know this is your last chance. You probably won't get to hear anything more about the candidates after tonight. So I sacrifice you all made. Um, as you heard, I work for Cray. Uh, how many people know who Cray is? Great, okay. On an airplane, it's kind of 50-50. You get the like, who, or the, wow, they're still in business. Uh, so <laughs> we are still in business. Our corporate headquarters are actually in downtown Seattle. Um, I'm a principal engineer at Cray, and I'm the technical lead for a group that's developing a new programming language called Chapel. Um, Chapel is designed to uh, make parallel programming more productive on large-scale machines. You can think of it as, well, and on small-scale machines, but we're particularly interested in large-scale. Uh, so large distributed memory machines. And over the course of the talk tonight, you'll hear a little bit about why we're doing Chapel, and you'll get a sense of what Chapel looks like. Um, at the end, if we have time, maybe I'll try to program Chapel interactively. You can kind of see it yourself. If there are features you'd like to see. Um, and I should say that uh, my speaking style, I like to take questions as I go. So please don't hesitate to throw up your hand if anything occurs to you you'd like to know. Um, I'll make up the time if we need to, and it'll all work out great. Uh, this is a slide that says you shouldn't assume anything about Cray's future based on anything you hear from me, which is kind of a demoralizing way to start a talk, but there you have it. Um, so Cray uh, is the supercomputing super computing company. Right? We build supercomputers and have uh, since it was founded in 72 by Seymour Cray. Um, as I alluded to in 2000, uh, local company Terra purchased Cray research from SGI and formed Cray Incorporated. And ever since then, the corporate headquarters have been here in downtown Seattle. Um, that said, we have something like eight uh, major uh, campuses, um, both across the nation and worldwide, as well as sales and service people all over the globe. Um, Cray focuses, of course, on supercomputers. But in addition to sort of just the raw computation, more and more, Cray is also looking at storage, because of course, storing and retrieving data is a big part of computation nowadays, and also data analytics, because of course, Everybody has all this data. They need to do things with it. Uh, Cray is uh, oftentimes a good place to do that. Um, so the vision of Cray is to provide the systems and the tools that our customers need to solve uh, the world's hardest problems. Right? Now, I'm not usually one to talk a lot about Cray, uh, so this is about all I'll say about Cray tonight. Um, mostly I'll talk about Chapel, but before I do that, I want to give you a sense of kind of how do we program large-scale parallel machines today, although it's going to be a very high-level example. Uh, but just again, so I have a sense of who you guys are. So how many people have programmed a supercomputer or a cluster, say? OK, so a few of you. Um, so this is kind of to give you a little bit of a sense of what things are like, although it's going to be so high level, it'll only barely give you any sense. Um, I'm going to basically uh, take a look at the simplest parallel computation you can imagine. Uh, well, almost simplest, maybe. Um, stream triad, this is a very simple benchmark. It's designed as a memory benchmark. And the idea is if you have three vectors, you're going to scale one of the vectors by a scalar, add it to a second vector, assign it to a third vector. So as you can imagine, if you remember even your most basic linear algebra, um, this is something you could trivially do in parallel. If we chunk our vectors up into four chunks, say, I could run each of those chunks on a core. It could do the multiplies and adds that it owns. And cooperatively, the four cores would solve the whole thing, hopefully four times as fast as one core would. Uh, so this is sort of my cartoon for the shared memory version of this stream triad computation. Um, if we were running on a distributed memory machine, like a cluster or a Cray, then we'd probably want to replicate that scalar alpha so that rather than communicating to get it, each uh, processor, each node would have its own local copy of alpha that it can compute on. And of course, the reality today is that we don't just have distributed memory, but we have distributed compute nodes that are themselves multi-core shared memory nodes. So in practice, you get this sort of hybrid where the red lines here are supposed to indicate boundaries between distributed uh, processors, and the blue indicate multiple cores within a single processor. OK? So again, uh, not the hardest computation in the world by any means, but kind of a nice, um, how do you do this today? So the first program model I'm going to show you is MPI. Uh, this stands for Message Passing Interface. And MPI is uh, basically a programming model in which you run a bunch of copies of your program, and you can put in calls to this MPI library to communicate between the copies. So if you have some data I need, I can say, uh, let me receive some data from you, and you'd better know you need to send it to me. And through that, we'll, we'll communicate that data between ourselves. 
Now, the black code here is just kind of straightforward C code, more or less. The red code represents uh, the MPI specific code. And then the green code down in the bottom there is the actual computation I was trying to do, the, the vector um, multi uh, scalar multiply and add. Um, there's not much MPI in this code. And that shouldn't be surprising because, of course, this is, um, depending on your outlook, an embarrassingly parallel code or a pleasingly parallel code in that you can just sort of chunk up the work and everybody can work on their piece and not really worry about each other very much. So the only MPI we really have here is some uh, basic calls that set things up. You can kind of figure out, like, who am I? You know, I'm, I'm the ith copy of the program if there are p copies of the program running. And that determines which chunk I own. And then at the end, there's a reduction to kind of make sure that we all sort of, uh, you know, got the right answer or something like that. Um, so anyway, that's MPI. Uh, if you're doing anything actually interesting that involves coordinating between your program copies, which is most scientific computations, then this code would be littered with sends and receives and broadcasts and various things like that. It would be much more complicated. Um, but again, nothing too difficult here. Now, as I said, this will give us distributed memory execution. But of course, today, um, we don't only have distributed memory, but then we have shared memory parallelism as well. Now, we could just run multiple copies of this program per node. Uh, and a lot of people do that in practice. But the other thing we could do is to mix in OpenMP, which many of you may be familiar with. Uh, so OpenMP is a directive-based markup. Um, you basically use it to say things like, take these loop iterations and parallelize them across the cores. So it's designed for shared memory programming. And here you can see in blue, I've decorated uh, some of my loops with these OpenMP pragmas, which say these are parallel loops. And so OpenMP is going to create some threads and uh, divide the iterations across the threads. Um, so now I've got that hybrid shared and distributed memory execution of the program. And the main thing I want you to take away from all this code is that the way we talk about the things we care about most in parallel computing, which is what's parallel, uh, what things can I run simultaneously? And uh, locality kinds of things. Where should things run? Where should data be allocated? Um, when we talk in terms of MPI and OpenMP, we use completely different notations, completely different syntax, um, completely different concepts. And that seems kind of unfortunate, right? Um, it gets worse when you start throwing more exotic hardware into the mix. So like if you have GPUs on your machine, um, a lot of people program GPUs with CUDA, of course. And so on the right, on the left here is the code we've been looking at. On the right is a CUDA version of uh, the Stream Triad benchmark. And the purple code here is sort of all the CUDA specific code. And you know, it's, it's obviously pretty small. But again, the point here is that simplest computation you could think of, trivial to parallelize, locality is completely trivial as well. And yet we have a completely different set of concepts, syntax, things to program it. Right? And this leads to what we refer to sometimes as kind of the alphabet soup of HPC programming, where it's like you're just mixing and mashing these program models together, uh, each one of which has its own quirks and notations. So kind of the thesis of this talk and a lot of my work is that I think the HPC community, the high performance comp computing community, suffers from having too many different ways to talk about the two main things we care about, which again is parallelism, like what can I run simultaneously, and locality. Where should it run and where should the data live? Things like that. OK? Um, so this sort of paints maybe a, a sad picture of HPC programming. And you could ask, well, how do we get to this state? And I think the reason the HPC community got to this place is that um, we're a very performance-driven community, not surprisingly. And we're very hardware-oriented. And so we spend a lot of time designing sort of bold, fast, new hardware. And then we uh, start from that hardware and say, well, how are we going to program this? And we, we start from the hardware and build our way up. Um, so given a system and the capabilities it has, we tend to uh, design features that give us access to the performance that system can, can offer. And things like portability or generality or programmability, these, aren't, these are kind of second order concerns for our community. Because it's all about, I've got this fast machine. I want to program it. And you know, poor programmers, they can just suffer through it. So the result of that is that when you have different types of hardware parallelism that you want to target, you tend to use different programming models. So we've seen MPI for internode and OpenMP for shared memory and CUDA for GPU. And the point is, if you want to target multiple types of hardware parallelism, you typically have to mix these programming models together. And another way of looking at it is that each of these programming models has a different unit of software parallelism. Like for MPI, we run multiple copies of the program simultaneously. But for OpenMP, you saw we just decorate loops, and that creates little threads that execute those loop iterations. So again, if you want to use different types of software parallelism in a single program, you again have to mix and match these different programming models. Okay? 
So this isn't the absolute worst thing in the world. Um, it gives us some benefits. We have a lot of control. If a hardware system can do something, we can probably do it. It just may be a little bit painful. Um, we also have generality for that reason. And because these are fairly low-level models, they're relatively easy to implement, which isn't to say they're trivial, but they're pretty close to the hardware. So you know, there's not a lot of software stack to create. But the downsides, as you've started to see, is we have kind of a mix of notations. Um, there's lots of user-managed detail, a lot of which you haven't actually seen here. And the codes end up being fairly brittle to changes. Um, and that could either be changes in the algorithm or changes in the hardware. And I think GPUs are a good example of that. When they came on the scene, you know, MPI and OpenMP were no longer sufficient. CUDA and other things started cropping up. OK? So this is sort of the state of where we are today. Um, so let's transition to Chapel. Uh, why are we doing Chapel? Well, if, if kind of the picture I have I painted here isn't sort of motivation enough. Um, the way I think about Chapel is we're trying to design a language that's as productive as Python, The sort of people look forward to programming in the same way Python programmers seem to get really excited about Python. Um, as fast as Fortran, as portable as C, as scalable as MPI, which again is sort of the de facto standard in HPC. And again, as fun as kind of your favorite language, right? Which for many of you is hopefully C++, given where we are. Um, but, you know, make programming with something that's enjoyable as opposed to just gritting your teeth and getting through it, which is the way I think it is for a lot of HPC programmers. Uh, so can a single language do all this? We think that uh, it can, and we think Chapel is uh, such language or has the potential to be such a language. Um, so a good question is, why don't we have such languages already? Uh, you know, a lot of people worry there are probably significant technical challenges here. And to be clear, there definitely are technical challenges. But I don't think this is the reason that the HPC community doesn't have better programming models than what we have today. Um, so again, I think there are technical challenges, but I don't think that's the main issue. I think the real issue is uh, within the HPC community and arguably more broadly, there's just a lack of long-term efforts, of resources to pursue languages like this, of community will to stick with them until they're successful, um, of co-design between developers and users. Often it's sort of hardware and people close to hardware designing languages, and so you don't necessarily get all the way up to the users. Um, and patience, because as we all know, good languages take a long time to design and get up to snuff. Yeah? Another, another one would be legacy code that exists Yeah, so uh, I guess the mic may not pick up the audience questions. The point was legacy code may be another barrier here. I think it is a challenge, but if you think about languages that have, so I was doing my graduate work in the 90s, and we would submit papers on a language we were doing at that time, and we'd sometimes get reviews that said language design is dead. But since then, Java's become popular, Python's become popular, so it's not dead. And when, I, when you look at things those languages did well, one of the things they did well is interoperability, right? So both Java and Python have a strong interoperability story. And so I think one can create new languages. C, not with C++. Well, that's true. Um, but many of those legacy codes are not written in C++. Uh, but I was going to say that, what's that? Some are, it's true. Uh, but I was going to say that I think interoperability with existing languages is a way to preserve legacy codes um, without rewriting them all from scratch. And that's certainly part of uh, Chapel, the way Chapel deals with that. So I think that is a barrier, but I don't think that's the main reason we don't have new languages in HPC. At least that's my opinion. Um, so anyway, uh, these are reasons I think we don't have uh, great languages in HPC. And uh, Chapel is our attempt to reverse this trend. So starting to describe Chapel, um, again, as you've heard, it's a productive parallel programming language. Uh, some of the adjectives I use to describe it, it's an extensible language, it's portable, it's open source, it's a collaborative effort, and it's a work in progress. And I'll sort of take you through the language, and then at the end I'll come back to these points and kind of dive into them in a bit more detail. Um, and the goals of Chapel are to support general parallel programming. And I think of this as being if you have a parallel algorithm in mind and some parallel hardware you want to run it on, you ought to be able to do that in Chapel. And if not, then we failed, or maybe Chapel needs to be improved. And the, the second, of course, to make parallel programming far more productive. Now, I've used this term productive or productivity several times. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, I think it's been a couple of years at least, but um, some people from Cray came and gave a presentation um, on Chapel previously yep. to this group. Yeah. Um, so just kind of as you go forward, can you kind of highlight 
changes that have been made or things that have happened in the language okay. since that time? Yeah, so the, again, for the camera, the question was, uh, we gave a chapel talk here a couple of years ago. Could, we, could I highlight changes as I go that have happened since then? Um, I will try to do that. Uh, I would say the core of the language is fairly similar. Um, and most of the changes have been in the impl the imp making the implementation better and filling out some of the features in the language that were kind of half-baked first time around. But I don't know those will show up practically in my slides. Um, but if you ask me that again at the end, I'll, I'll talk about some of the highlights from the past couple of years. Um, I do have some results at the end of this talk that I've, I, they're like hot off the presses as of yesterday. Um, and that'll show you some very current stuff we've been doing. Uh, so that's one, that'll be one thing that'll be very new from a couple of years ago. Yeah. How many people were here at the talk a couple of years ago? Okay, some of you, but fortunate not all. Um, yeah, that was given by my colleague Thomas Van Doren. I was in the audience for that one this time I'm up here. So, All right, so um, as I was saying, I've used this term productive or productivity a few times. And I think this is one of those vague terms where we all sort of have a sense of what it means to us, but does it all, do we all have the same definition of it? So. Um, I usually try to start these talks by sort of asking, you know, what does productivity mean? And I'm going to answer that myself. When I go around and talk to people in HPC, I get kind of three different answers about productivity. Um, if I'm talking to, like, uh, young students or recent graduates, for them productivity is often like, well, you know, I learned about things like Python or MATLAB or Java in school, and that's what's product productive to me. And then we say, well, welcome to HPC. You know, we use Fortran and C and this funny thing called MPI. And, they sort of feel like they have to throw away all these things they learned about that seem modern and, and cool. Now, if you talk to a seasoned HPC programmer, you often get this answer, well, that's that really sugary stuff that I don't need because my role in life is to suffer. And that's a little bit tongue in cheek, but that is their attitude. They sort of feel that um, higher level features are necessarily going to be expensive and necessarily put overhead into their code. Um, I believe that well-designed higher level features don't necessarily have that effect, um, but this is certainly the... Uh, the perception people have. And I think what they're really saying, I, I mean, this is my, my tongue in cheek version, obviously. I think what they're really saying is, I want full control over my code to ensure that I don't throw any performance away. Because again, performance is kind of the name of the game in HPC. And that's a completely reasonable um, stance and thing to be worried about. Uh, and the last thing is, if you talk to computational scientists, the astronomers, the physicists, the chemists, um, they sort of say, well, I want to focus on parallel computation and my science and my algorithms, and I don't want to uh, wrestle with a lot of machine-specific details, right? I don't want you to tell me, like, oh, you have to use CUDA now. Let me teach you about CUDA, or, or to worry a lot about mapping it down to the system. Uh, and again, uh, all three of these, I think, are completely reasonable uh, points of view. So on the chapel team, we're trying to come up with something that makes all three of those perspectives happy, right? Something that lets the computational scientists express the kinds of things they want to express without taking away that fine-grained control that an HPC programmer would want and implement it in language that's as attractive as, as recent graduates want. <clears throat> so going back a few slides, I sort of said, you know, we've got enough different ways of talking about present locality, like we need to stop doing this. Uh, but of course, uh, because I'm designing a language, I'll say, well, let's do one more and then we'll stop. Um, so this is, this is that same stream triad computation in Chapel. And uh, it looks much shorter than the other codes we looked at. And you might think I just sort of took out the inner loop or something. But this is the entire program. Uh, so it hopefully has a lot of the kind of feel of a scripting language to you. Um, and uh, over the course of the talk, I'll teach you enough about Chapel that you understand this code. But for now, the main thing I want to say about it is that not only is this code sort of nice and short and hopefully fairly readable, but it's also very flexible. Um, this one code could be a serial code, it could be a shared memory parallel code, a distributed memory code, uh, could run on a GPU, and it's all done through this demapped clause, which basically says how, to, and I've left out a little bit of an expression there, but only kind of the end of the line kind of expression. Um, and this says, how should I map this index set and this computation down to the system resources? And by plugging in different recipes there for mapping it down, you can end up with very different executions of this computation. Okay. So again, uh, this is just a teaser. Uh, don't expect you to understand everything here now. But by the end of the talk, hopefully, you'll be on board with like, OK, now we've got this. Uh, but before I start going through the language, um, this sort of emphasizes the philosophy that we're trying, to, we're trying to go after here, which is that if you do top-down language design, so rather than starting from the hardware and building up, you think about, well, how do we want to express parallelism? And how do we want to express locality? And how do we map those things down to the machine? 
you can end up with a much better result and one that sort of teases details of algorithm and implementation away from one another so that uh, applied scientists and HPC experts and the compiler and the runtime can all focus on things that they're good at without them all being jumbled together. Okay, so that's kind of the motivation for Chapel uh, in the first part of my talk. And next what I'm going to do is take you through some of the features in Chapel. Um, it's a big language, so you won't see all of it, but hopefully you'll get a flavor of it tonight. Um, and then at the very end of the talk, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the project. Or actually, do I do that tonight? I may not have updated my outline. I'll talk a little bit about some resources available to you. And as I mentioned at the very end, we could either do a little bit of hands-on, or I've got some hot off the presses um, results that you might find interesting. That I, they're still interesting to me because they're brand new. Um, so any questions motivation-wise before I start telling you about the language? All right. Um, so as I go through the language, I'm going to use this diagram as kind of a roadmap. And this diagram is uh, something we, we put together to illustrate this philosophy we have in the language of what we call multi-resolution design. And the idea here is that, um, so I've argued that many of the parallel languages we use are very low level and close to the system. And it's not as though they've never been high level parallel languages before, but they typically have not caught on. And I think one of the main reasons is that they're high level and they're far away from the system. And if those high level abstractions fail you, you have no way of getting down closer to the system again. So when we start out with Chapel, we were trying to figure out how to kind of thread this needle. And we decided that what we wanted were multiple tiers of features, some of which were lower level and more explicit and closer to the machine, others of which were higher level and more abstract. And the idea is that within your program, you can move between these different levels as you need to or want to uh, for performance or for control or whatever. And that, in fact, you can build the higher level abstractions in terms of the lower level ones so that you as a programmer can, again, extend Chapel uh, by creating your own higher level abstractions. Okay? Uh, so that's the philosophy. And again, I'll be using this uh, little, little stack here as a roadmap as I go. And I'm going to start out with what's called the lower level Chapel. Um, it's still quite a bit higher level than most HPC programming models. But again, these are the features that are closer to the machine and give you more explicit control over how things run. Uh, and I'm going to start with the base language, which you can think of as if you took Chapel and you pulled out every feature related to parallelism and distributed memory programming, uh, the base language is what you'd be left with. So think of it as like the, the C or the Fortran upon which Chapel is based, except that we started from uh, scratch rather than extending an existing language. And the base language is, is pretty huge. Uh, I could probably spend a whole day talking about the base language. So I'm just going to give you a simple example that illustrates some features. And uh, hopefully that will give you enough of a flavor of the language that you'll follow the rest of the examples in the talk and be able to figure out other things on your own offline if you want to. Uh, so first of all, we've got uh, iterators. Uh, I come from a little bit of a programming language background, so I call these clue-style iterators. But everyone who's young says, everybody's got these now. Like, who knows what clue is? Um, if you haven't seen these by any chance, they're a lot like a function or a procedure, but rather than returning a single time, they have these yield statements, which kicks a value back to the call site, but then continues executing on. So this iterator uh, computes n Fibonacci numbers in the Fibonacci sequence. You can see that yield statement is within a for loop that counts from 1 to n, so I'm going to yield n things. And each time I yield one of those things, again, it's going to go back to the call site, but then the iterator will logically continue on until it finishes that loop and falls out of the iterator. Um, you can see an invocation of the uh, iterator over on the right there. So I'm saying for f in fib of n, do right line of f. So I'm basically printing out the first n Fibonacci numbers. Um, and again, each time I hit this yield statement, that's going to basically bind a value back to my index variable f for that iteration loop. And then after the iteration loop, logically, the iterator continues on again. OK? Yeah, question? Is that a logical operand there on the last line on the left? Mode? This one here? So this is a swap operator. It's basically like uh, you know exchange A and B, but so you don't have to do it yourself. And I always assign the wrong thing and end up like overwriting one of them or whatever. So yeah, that's just going to swap my current and my next values and set me up for the next iteration. And uh, yeah, uh, maybe that's enough said about that. Um, the next thing I want to show you is this is called a configuration constant. Uh, this is. Uh, a fairly sugary feature, but a really nice one. Uh, it's basically designed to help you avoid command line argument parsing in most cases. So this says, give me a constant named n. Uh, it's going to have the default value of 10. But that config keyword says, give me a hook that allows me to set it on the, on the command line. So when I run my program, I could say, like, 
uh, oh, it should be a double dash, dash dash n equals whatever I wrote there, 100,000 or a million or whatever, and I overwrite that default value, and for that execution of the program, it'll have that, that other value. Right, so the hope here is that for many, many programs, you don't have to do any command line argument parsing anymore. Okay. So that can be in any compilation unit, any dot o that's compiled into the, uh, in the final program? So we don't have separate compilations, so we don't talk about separate dot o's, uh, but any module you define, which is kind of our top level software unit, can define its own configuration constants and vars, and um, so yeah, you can set any of them across any of the modules that compose to make your program. Uh, if you have multiple modules that uh, define the same, like that both define n, for example, then you can use the module name to disambiguate them, like you know, module1.n or module2.n. Yeah. Um, you may have noticed that I don't have any type declarations in this code. So things like n or current or next or the argument n to fib or the return type of fib, uh, none of those are declared. Um, to be clear, you can declare all of those types. Uh, because a lot of times declaring types is important, of course, for safety or documentation or things like that. Uh, but you can also leave them off. And if you leave them off, then the compiler will do type inference to determine the types. So even though this looks a lot like a scripting language, it's still a statically typed language. Um, a variable like n can't change its type over the course of its lifetime. And uh, so the compiler is basically going to do a little flow analysis where it says, well, I know 10 is an integer, so I know n is an integer. And then I pass that to fib, so I know that I need a copy of fib that accepts integers. And then I see that current and next are, in are integers because they're initialized with integers. I is an integer because we're uh, looping over an integer range. I'm yielding current. That's an integer. So f is an integer back over here. And it just kind of flows all the way through. Um, again, uh, if you want to, you can declare the types of all these things. And we often do that, for example, in library interfaces because that's pretty important. Um, but in my slides, I typically leave them off both for brevity and kind of to show off the fact that you don't need to. Um, we also have zippered iterations. So here, what I've done is I, originally I'm just iterating over fib. Now I've extended it, so I'm iterating over the zip of a range, zero to hash n, and fib of n. So this says iterate over these two things kind of simultaneously or in lockstep, if you will. Uh, I'm going to get two things yielded back there, uh, i, which is going to be an integer from zero to n minus one, and fib, which is going to be my Fibonacci number. And so now I can say things like fib of zero is zero, and fib of one of one, and so on and so forth. Um, so we've got ranges uh, built into the language, um, range types and values, and operators on ranges. So over here, I have 1 to n, which, as you'd expect, is kind of the integers 1, 2, 3, 4, up to n. And over here, uh, this is actually uh, kind of a stylized thing we do a lot. The hash n actually can be applied to any range and says, give me the first n elements. Uh, here, I'm basically, uh, I have the, the infinite range, or conceptually infinite range, 0 to infinity. And then I say, give me the first n elements of that. So that basically gives me 0 to n minus 1. So this is sort of a, a cute idiom we tend to use a lot, rather than always typing out 0 to n minus 1 when we want to do zero-based programming in Chapel. Um, we've got tuples. An example that you see in this code is that, again, the two values being yielded by my zippered iteration are, in fact, stored in a tuple. I can then detuple that into the separate i and f components, or I could have just kept it together as a tuple if I had wanted to. Um, and that's sort of my very simple introduction to some of the base language features in Chapel. There's a very long list of other base language features. Again, if you think about it, our goal is to create something that's as modern, as rich as you know, a Java, a C++, a C Sharp, a Python. So the base language itself is quite large. Um, one of the main features that might be of interest to this group is we have uh, object-oriented programming, but we have decided not to be a pure object-oriented language. So like the code I previously showed didn't have any classes or records in it. And we actually have two types of objects in Chapel. There are records, which are value-based. And you can think of that as like a C++ struct, for example. And then we have classes which are reference-based. And those are like pointers to C++ structs or like Java classes, if you prefer. Um, so the one is sort of very copy-oriented and value-oriented. And the other is very reference-oriented and more about identity than about value. Um, and there's a bunch of other stuff here as well. Uh, but that's all I'm going to say about the base language tonight. So any questions about the base language before we go on? All right, everybody following? Well enough? Yeah, great, OK. All right, so let's get into the stuff that makes Chapel unique. Down here in the lower level features of the language, we have task parallelism. Um, in the higher level features, we have something called data parallelism. And I'll, I'll distinguish those as we go. 
Um, in the lower level, we also have locality control, which is talking about where do things run on the architecture? Uh, where is data stored? Where do tasks run? So task parallelism, for me, means a style of parallel programming in which you define different pieces of computation that you want to have execute simultaneously. And they may or may not, depending on your system resources. So like if you're on a four core machine and you create a thousand tasks, clearly they're not going to all run simultaneously, but they'll be multiplexed as, as the OS would if you even had a single core. Um, but the, the key is that you're saying, like, here are distinct computations, and I'd like to run them as simultaneously as the hardware allows me, essentially. All right, so I'll show you a couple ways of creating tasks in Chapel. And in fact, there are only three ways to do it. Um, so one way is, and the simplest way, is the begin statement. You can prefix any other statement with the keyword begin. And what that says is create a task to execute this statement while the original task goes on to the next statement. So here I've just got a simple program where I say, begin a task to print out hello world, and meanwhile I'll go on and print out goodbye. So I've got two tasks executing once I hit that begin. And because I haven't done anything to synchronize or coordinate between them, the things they print out could come out in any order. I could either see hello world and then goodbye, or goodbye and then hello world. All right. Uh, so that's the simplest way to create parallelism in Chapel. And that gives you a very sort of unstructured, freeform style of parallelism. The other form I'm going to show you is what we call the co-for-all loop. Uh, this is a far more structured way of creating parallelism. It's a lot like the for loop we saw before, but what it says is that every iteration of this loop should be executed by a distinct task. So for example, if I ran uh, this loop for four trip counts, I would get four tasks, each one of which would be executing the body with its own unique copy of the index variable. Yeah? I'm assuming a task is a very abstract thing that's going to map to hardware in different ways. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. So you'll notice I use the word task instead of thread. Yeah. So um, we talk in terms of tasks, which again are sort of chunks of computation that you want to have run in parallel. They, of course, will be executed using threads, which could be system threads, they could be user level threads, they could be hardware threads, and we, don't, we try to say as little about that as possible in the language. Now, when you're using Chapel, uh, often you want to be very aware of, well, how are my tasks going to be executed and what kind of hardware am I running on so that you can think about the appropriate number of tasks to create and how they should be mapped to the system. Um, but by and large, within the language itself, we talk strictly in terms of tasks. Uh, in practice, by default, we tend to run on top of a runtime that uses user-level tasking. And so we do fine-grained switching between tasking based on hitting blocking events or long latency events like communication, for example. Question? Uh, so on the previous page, you had the begin, begin, uh, begin example. Uh -huh. <clears throat> um, so would hello, goodbye world be a possible output? Oh, uh, that's a good question. Yeah, so uh, the question was, um, you know, I've got these two tasks printing things out. Is there any chance that the uh, output will be spliced together? Um, and uh, the write line routine is basically written in a way that's task safe. And so it's guaranteed that once write line starts printing out its output, it's not going to get interspersed with others. So I'm guaranteed to get one of those two outputs and not sort of the messy glomming together of it. Yeah, good question. Is this based on an intermediate language, or is this so uh, it's a well, it's a compiled language, but the implementation approach that our current compiler takes by default is to compile to C. So if you looked under the covers, you would see us translating Chapel to C and then linking in some runtime libraries and things like that. Um, of course, to the typical end user, it looks like a compiler where you just get a binary out. But no, like, there's no virtual machine or anything like that. Um, I was going to say, like a uh, traditional compiler, you know, there's a flag you can throw to catch the intermediate C, just like you could catch the assembly from a C compiler or something like that. Um, we also have a backend that uh, goes straight to LLVM. And I think in the long term, that'll become the default backend. But today, the C backend is the default. Yeah. Yeah, virtual machines in HPC are kind of looked at with scorn because, you know, again, we want to be as fast as possible, as close to the iron as possible. We don't want any virtual machines. Oh, how do we sort of know what the model of the hardware is? Um, so part of that is done through the runtime. So when you compile Chapel, there's some different options you can choose to choose different runtime configurations. And so uh, the runtime configurations sort of know how to map to different kinds of hardware, for example. Um, the other way we do that is there's actually a concept in the language where you can define a model of your target hardware within Chapel itself. 
And so if you had a, uh, an exotic new type of hardware we haven't seen before, and you would need to teach us how to run a task on it or how to allocate memory on it, things like that, you actually would write a chunk of Chapel code that represented that piece of target hardware and teach us, you know, so how do we create a task? How do we allocate memory? And the compiler actually maps down to that interface when it's targeting the machine. Um, so that's something called a locale model. Uh, that's one of the things that's new since the last time we were here, uh, to your question. Um, and the idea there is to be future-proof as new uh, architectures come out, which seems to be happening more and more frequently these days. Um, to not kind of require you to go in and change the compiler or change the runtime. Hopefully you can do that within the language use itself for the most part. Um, but that's something I won't have much chance to talk about tonight. Uh, it's a pretty advanced feature, as you can imagine. All right. Uh, so back on my co-for-all loop. So again, the idea here is uh, each trip of this loop is going to be a separate task. And the other thing about co-for-all loops is there's an implicit join at the end of the loop. So the original task won't go on until all of the iteration tasks have completed. Uh, so here I basically have a simple case where I just create a task uh, from zero to num tasks minus one. They each print out a little hello world message uh, indicating their unique ID. And again, I haven't done anything to coordinate between the tasks themselves, so the output, if I'm running on four cores, could be you know, in any order of those four messages. But the guarantee is that the all tasks done uh, output will be guaranteed to come after the others because, again, of that implicit join at the end of the loop. Question? So, if you say the join is implicit, uh, can I somehow wait for the previous begin statement the previous Yeah, so if you're working with begins, there are a couple different ways to wait for that task to finish. Um, one is we have a compound statement called sync that you can wrap around a chunk of code, and that says don't go on until all the parallelism within here is completed. That's a pretty big hammer. Uh, the other way you could do it is uh, in more of a data-oriented fashion. So you could have the task uh, write a result to a synchronized location, and then you could you know, check to see whether that synchronized location had completed or not. Um, so yeah, those would be ways in which you would do that. Okay. Um, which is a good lead-in. So I'm talking mostly about tasks tonight. Uh, when we do coordinate between tasks, we do that with uh, data-oriented uh, concepts. So the first is atomic variables, a lot like atomics in C++ or C. Uh, so something you probably are all uh, familiar with. They support parent swap, atomic add, things like that. And the other one, which is maybe a little bit more unique, unless you happen to work at Terra, which at least one person in the audience did, is what we call synchronized variables. And these are variables that store a value like normal, but they also store a full empty state associated with them. And the idea is when you read a synchronized variable, you block until it's full, and then you leave it empty, so you're consuming that value. And when you write, you block until it's empty, and upon writing the value, you, you leave it full. Um, so I'll show you a quick example of sync variables in practice. This is a bounded buffer problem. Uh, so what I'm going to do is create, uh, let's see if I've got a laser. I'm going to create this, uh, this variable called buff here. It's an array variable where the element type is sync real. And what that means is it's an array of real floating point values. But again, that sync keyword says that along with the floating point value, there's also this full empty bit. Uh, so then I'm going to use a begin statement to create a task to be the producer. And the original task will become the consumer. And the producer and the consumer are basically just going to spin through a loop, incrementing i, circling around the buffer. And then the producer is writing to the buffer at location i, and the consumer is reading from the buffer at location i. And if you think about coding up bounded buffer, like with POSIX threads, for example, usually you have all these conditions to say, like, have I wrapped around upon myself and caught up if I'm the producer, or if I'm the consumer, you know, have I gotten ahead of the producer? And all of that here is taken care of uh, implicitly for you through the sync uh, full empty state, because if the producer wraps around on itself, it's going to get to an element that's already full, and its attempt to write to it is going to block until it becomes empty. And similarly, the consumer, uh, upon trying to read from an element, if it gets ahead, that element's going to be empty, so it's going to block until the producer fills it. Right? So I'd argue this is you know, one of the cleaner bounded buffer uh, implementations you'll probably ever see. And that's the synchronization variables in practice. All right. Now with the base language, I said there are tons of other features I won't be able to talk about. With the task parallel features, you've actually seen the vast majority of them. Um, CoBegins are the third way of creating tasks. They're a compound statement uh, form of creating tasks. Uh, we have single variables that are like sync variables, but they're never actually emptied. Uh, we talked about these sync statements, which you can use to uh, wait for all tasks to join. And there's also a serial statement that you can use to conditionally squash parallelism. Uh, 
But that's uh, the core of the task parallelism in the language. And in fact, all parallelism in the language is implemented using these features. So even the higher level data parallelism maps down eventually to these task parallel features. And so this is sort of the only ways to create parallelism in Chapel. All right, question. Um, single variables are actually identical to sync variables, except that uh, they can never be emptied. So it's like once they're filled, reads are going to block until, reads basically block until full, but leave full. And there's no operations that will ever empty that variable again. So these are often useful for things like if you're doing future-based computations where you're saying like a begin, like begin, go off and do this computation and store your result in a single variable. And then once that result's there, anybody can go read that result. Um, that's the kind of case where we typically use the single variables. And the term single comes from single assignment because there can only be one to it. But it doesn't have to be a declaration time, so it's different than like const, say. Exactly, yep, yep. Okay, so that's task parallelism. And then the last low level feature we'll look at is locality control. And again, this is the term I use to describe uh, talking about where things are executing on a large scale machine. So, you know, where are tasks running, where is data allocated, things like that. And the key concept in the locality control section language is this type that's uh, called a locale. The locale essentially represents a unit of your target architecture. And the idea is that the locale uh, is something that's useful for reasoning about locality. So if two things are in the same locale, uh, they're going to be relatively close to each other, relatively cheap to coordinate with one another. If they're in different locales, it's going to cost more. So that's sort of the abstract way of talking about locales. Practically speaking, on almost any machine, uh, a locale is basically going to be a compute node. So as you can imagine, like if, if I'm running a task in a compute node and it accesses memory in that compute node, well, that's going to be really cheap because it's just local memory access. But if, I, if it wants to access memory in a remote compute node, well, that's going to be in a different locale. It's going to cost something. And that cost corresponds to going over the network. Okay, so again, locales are useful for thinking about, like, is this close and cheap and uh, lightweight, or is it remote and expensive? And I should think about whether or not I really want to do that. Um, so when you run a chapel program, you specify the number of locales to execute it on uh, at execution time. And there's sort of a long form and a short form way of doing this. So in both these command lines, I'm saying, use eight locales to run my program. And in practice, on most machines, that's going to go out and talk to the queuing system or the resource management system, get eight compute nodes, and it'll start running my program using those compute nodes. Now within the source text, there are a couple built-in variables that allow you to refer to the locales in which your program is running. So there's this built-in uh, config const num locales, which says how many locales am I running on? And in fact, that's what we're setting on these command lines here. And then there's this array of locale objects. And again, you can think of this as sort of an array of, of these values that correspond directly to the machine resources on which my program is running. So one of these for each of the compute nodes on which I'm executing. And last thing you need to know about getting the program up and running is that uh, main, our sort of our entry point, is going to start executing on locale zero. So in order to use other locales, you have to explicitly do something. Um, so what can you do with these locales once you've got the array of them? Well, one thing you can do is introspect about the machine on which you're running. So you can say things like, how much memory does this locale have? Or how many processors does it have? Or what's its name or its ID? So do anything you'd want to know about the machine resources, you do through the locales, because they're your abstraction of the machine. And the other thing we do with them is we uh, steer computation to them. So the low-level way to do that is with these on clauses. The on clause basically says, uh, move this task to a different locale, or to a potentially different locale. So I mentioned that my program starts running on locale 0, so this first write line will execute there. I can then say on locales 1 do, and I can print something out from there, and so I'm printing this out from locale 1. Then when I leave the scope of this on clause, I'm back on locale 0 again. All right. Now in practice, we don't typically explicitly say like run on locale 3 or run on locale n because that makes your program pretty brittle. So typically what you're doing is more of a data-driven on clause where I say wherever element ij of array a lives, go there and do some big computation. Right? I want to be close to that element. Or maybe I've got some sort of graph or tree structure and I say go to the left child of this node and wherever that is, continue the search. Right? So these are the more frequent ways of writing on clauses where it's data-driven. And wherever that variable is stored, the task will go there and start executing. All right. So with the on clause, I can move uh, computations around the machine. And so something that's intriguing about Chapel, and hopefully seems completely obvious to you, but in HPC it's, it's a very uh, strange concept, 
is that parallelism and locality are two distinct concepts in language. So I showed you a cofrall loop, which gives you parallelism, but you're never leaving the current locale. So this is just a shared memory loop. It's only going to execute with my current processor cores. Um, I showed you some cases that used on clauses, and this is going to migrate a task around the machine, but it doesn't introduce any parallelism. It's still a sequential program. It's just one that's moving around the machine as it executes. But of course, you can compose these things, and so often we, we do. I can create a bunch of tasks, and then I can deal them out to my locales, and now I've got a program that's both distributed memory and parallel. Okay? Um, we think this is really a key feature because when you think about it, parallelism and locality are two different things. And yet, most HPC program models just bind the two together, and there's no way to talk about both of them, or they just don't talk about locality at all. Okay? So again, hopefully obvious, but pretty distinct for our space. All right, so let's talk a little bit about how data gets to different locales. Uh, again, when I start executing, I start executing locale zero. And whenever I de declare a variable, it's going to be allocated local to the locale in which I'm running. So this variable i is going to be stored with locale zero. Then if I uh, migrate my task to locale one and allocate another variable j, that's going to be stored in locale one's memory. Then maybe use a cofrall and create a task for every locale and migrate each task to its respective locale. And now if I hit a variable declaration like k, uh, each one of those tasks is going to have its own k allocated in that locale's memory. Okay? So the point is that variable declarations just end up kind of naturally wherever it is you happen to be executing. All right. Now, uh, Chapel is what's called a PGAS language. PGAS stands for Partition Global Address Space. And what this means is that you can refer to any variables that you can see, regardless of whether they're local or remote. And more than that, you can reason about where they actually live. So here, for example, in the inner loop, I'm writing k equals 2 times i plus j. Again, I've got a task running on each of these locales, so each one's going to compute this simultaneously with its own value of k. But of course, there's only one i and j, and they live over here. Uh, and I can see them just through normal lexical scoping, right? They're in my scope, so I can refer to them even though they happen to be remote. Um, so what happens if we look at locale 3, for example, it's doing its computation, k equals 2 times i plus j. And of course, i and j are remote, so uh, it's okay to access them. And what's going to happen is the compiler and the runtime are going to transfer their values over to locale 3, so I can basically read them. Or actually, in this case, what's actually going to happen is when I create the task to go over to locale 3, I'm actually going to pass i and j along with it, because the compiler can see that you're going to need them. And it can also see that they're uh, invariant within this loop. So it just passes them along with the active message that starts the execution on locale 3 and carries it along as part of its payload. Yeah, question? If they weren't invariant, then you'd have to communicate and go get them. Now, there are two re So, no. No automatic coherency, right? You, that's, that's on you, basically, as the programmer. Um, now, they're actually invariant here for two reasons. One of them is the obvious one, that I'm not actually modifying i and j in the loop. The other one is subtle, and, and I don't talk about it much in these slides, which is that um, when variables cross uh, over a parallel construct, um, depending on the type of the variable, in many cases, particularly small scalars like this, we basically create a const copy of it that's local to that task. So if I tried to assign i inside of this loop, it would actually say, I'm sorry, um, i is actually a const shadow copy of the original i. You can't modify it. Now, you can decorate that cofrall loop to say, well, I really want to modify it. Uh, like, give me a reference to it instead of a const copy. And in that case, you could modify i and j in here. And if all the tasks were trying to modify i and j, then you could have a race condition, potentially. So those shadow copies are introduced to try to eliminate a lot of common race conditions. Um, that said, uh, the language believes that race conditions are an important part of parallel computing for generality. So we do uh, give you the ability to shoot yourself in the foot. Okay. <laughs> So if there were another task running in parallel that updated i and j um, out before I got into the cofrall loop? Yeah. So again, those shadow variables are going to take a snapshot of i and j at the time that the tasks are created. So those modifications would not be seen. Now, again, if you put this clause on which says, well, no, I, I want to reference the original i and j, um, then if another task was modifying them simultaneously, the tasks could see those modifications. And again, it would be racy unless you used atomic variables or synchronized variables to kind of make sure that the memory consistency was correct. All right, so I sort of painted an ugly picture. I said, like, it's all on you. Uh, it, it's not completely all on you. These synchronized and atomic variables basically give you sort of good memory fence type of semantics. And so anytime you want to coordinate between tasks, you either do it with atomics and syncs, or you use atomics and sinks to sort of ensure that everything else is quiescent in memory. Yeah? So 
Yeah, yeah. So if I had been, say, an atomic int or a synchronized int, I mentioned that the type of the shadow variable or how it's passed into this task depends on its type. And for atomic and sync variables, it's always by reference because, of course, you know, their only value really is for multiple things to refer to it, right? So the default uh, intent, if you will, for atomic or sync variables as they get enter a parallel section is to be passed by reference. And so if I did something with uh, one of these outer scope atomic or sync variables, then we're sort of all doing it in a coordinated way. And uh, again, it's guaranteed to be safe by virtue of the fact that that variable has synchronized semantics with it. So physically, I is on machine zero and I read it from machine one. Right. Right. Yep. 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 Right. So the question is, I'm running here. I've got a synchronized or atomic variable back here. Um, I refer to it. So yeah, there has to be communication then to do that. Uh, either a remote read or write, or perhaps a remote active message, depending on what the type is and what the operation is. Um, but all that's going to be managed for you. And in fact, even if uh, this were just a normal int, and I put on that clause here which said, well, pass it to my tasks by ref, um, and, and there were, say, modifications to it in here, even in that case, there would be communication. So the communication isn't strictly for sync and uh, atomics. It's really for any variable that you're referring to remotely. Right, right. So the question was, do we have any way to do deadlock detection? Um, there's nothing in the compiler that does deadlock detection today. There is a mode you can run in in some configurations which says, uh, spend some extra time looking for deadlocks, and if you find one, let me know. Uh, so if you run your program and you feel like you maybe are in a deadlock, you can kill the program, rerun it with this mode, and it'll say, like, oh, you're in a deadlock, and my tasks are stuck here, basically. Um, that said, I, I think that that mode if I remember correctly, it only works in the shared memory execution, in the distributed memory. I don't think we've, I think you could do it. I think we've never put in that effort. Um, so usually we debug the deadlock things, shared memory, and then run them, uh, distributed memory. Yeah, good questions. Yeah? So does it find the, the deadlocks by searching for a loop dependency graph or something like that, or is it? So the run, or something that's completely different? the runtime based deadlock detection we use is based on the runtime sort of knows which tasks are running and what state they're in. And if it gets to a point where it says, all my tasks are blocked, then it says, well, I'm in deadlock. Um, and that's why it's easier to do in shared memory, of course, because you've got all that task manager right there. In, the distrib in distributed memory mode, you can imagine you might be able to detect local deadlock. But of course, somebody else may fire an on over to you that unblocks you. Or, uh, so in that case, you need a distributed deadlock detector. And again, that's something I, I don't believe we've ever put in the effort to do. A good uh, summer intern project, maybe. All right. Um, so when we're, I mentioned that uh, as part of this PGAS model, not only can you refer to things that are remote, but you can reason about the locality. The P stands for partitioned, and that's like, can I tell where things live? It's, it's not just a flat shared memory. And you can. There are a couple of ways to do it. Um, I show a couple of them here. So this here keyword is basically a way of uh, saying, what locale am I running on right now? So maybe I'm deep within my program, and I've followed some on clauses. I've lost track of where I am. Here basically returns the locale in which I'm currently on. And then any expression or variable that has storage related uh, to it, you can apply this dot locale uh, query to. And that says, you know, which locale is, uh, in this case, J stored on. So you can write code like, if here equals j.locale, then do one thing. And if not, maybe I want to create a local copy of it or something like that. Right? So this allows you to reason about at execution time, where am I and where is my data? And you know, I've lost track. Where is everything? All right? And those are the locality features of the language. Any other questions here? Yeah. Yes, that's a really good question. Do we have hierarchical locales? So um, classic chapel uh, only had sort of a single level of locales representing the compute nodes. And uh, that's the world we've been in for most of the project's history. I mentioned that one of the things that's new in the last couple of years is the locale models, which is a way of saying, here's how I want to think of my target architecture. Um, and you can think of it as kind of a nested block diagram. And the locale models give you the ability to have hierarchical locales. Uh, and we have used those to date primarily to model, for example, uh, compute nodes with multiple NUMA domains. So you know, if these four processors are in one NUMA domain and these four in another, then we have a locale that has two sublocales in it. 
Uh, we've also talked about using them for things like there's a GPU sublocale and a CPU sublocale or some other kind of accelerator and, and sort of the main processors, uh, but that sort of is, is current and ongoing work. Um, but yeah, the, the flat locale model, when we started the project, made a lot of sense. And as architectures get more and more hierarchical within shared memory um, or having distributed memory within a compute node, uh, then these hierarchical locale models are obviously more and more important. Okay. All right. So at this point, you guys are now experts in the low-level features in Chapel. Uh, you've had great questions, and so I'm running a little bit behind. Uh, but we'll talk a little bit about the higher-level features of the language, uh, and then I'll give you some pointers uh, for after tonight. Um, so the high-level features of Chapel uh, are really all about data parallelism, um, and I'll tell you what domain maps are as we go. Uh, and for me, uh, data parallelism is basically, rather than saying, like, create a task to do this, create a task to do that, it's like you've got some data set or index space, and you basically say, like, well, I want to do something over all these things in parallel, and I don't want to be hassled with managing the tasks manually, right? Uh, so a good example of this is our stream example that we started the talk with. And now I'll walk you through the same code I showed you in a bit more uh, detail. So one of the key features for data parallelism is called the domain. Uh, this curly bracket 1 to M is an example of a domain. And a domain is essentially an index set in the language. So this is a very simple one-dimensional index set. Um, they can also be multidimensional. They can be sparse index sets. They can be associative index sets, which give you like a dictionary kind of thing. Um, but in general, it's kind of a set of indices. And the way I've drawn it here, it looks a lot like an array. Uh, but again, this, it's not an array, it's just, you can think of it as the indices of an array, or the indices that describe an iteration space. Okay? So the next thing I'm going to do is, is define some arrays. I'm saying give me three variables, a, b, and c. Uh, the square brackets here are the array syntax. And I'm saying uh, define these arrays over the domain problem space, this 1 to m index set. And for each index, uh, give me a real floating point variable. So now I've got my three arrays, uh, and now I've actually got sort of order n storage associated with them. And then uh, the key uh, construct for data parallelism is the for all loop. Um, so we've seen up to now the for loop, which is completely sequential, the co for all loop, which creates an explicit task per iteration. And the for all loop is sort of in between. It says, do this in parallel, but again, don't hassle me with how many tasks to run or how to divide it up or things like that. Um, and those things can all be controlled, and, and by default, they're controlled by the things you're iterating over. Um, but basically, you're saying, like, sort of do the right thing. You know, based on how much hardware parallelism you've got, uh, divide up this iteration space. So here I'm doing a zippered for all, which says iterate over these three things, these three arrays in parallel. Um, give me the three elements out, and I'm going to multiply and add them together. Uh, if I were running this on, say, a four-core machine, and all these arrays were local to that uh, locale, then I'd use four tasks and sort of chunk up the, the arrays as you'd, as you'd expect. Um, so this is the very explicit way of writing data parallelism in Chapel. We also have what's called promotion, which is taking scalar operators or functions, applying arrays to them. And this is equivalent to that previous uh, for all loop we saw. So I can say, you know, all of A equals B plus alpha times C. And I think this is the form I showed you at the beginning of the talk. All right. So that's how we express data parallelism. Um, data parallelism is another fairly big section of the language. I talked about some of these rich domain and array types we have. Uh, we have slicing, which you can basically refer to uh, complete subsets of arrays, including sparse subsets or strange slices or things, uh, by slicing them with either ranges or other domains. Um, I mentioned promotion, which is this notion of calling scalar functions with array arguments. Uh, you can do this for built-in functions like POW, or you can do it for user functions if you write your own functions. Uh, we've got reductions and scans, so you can write MapReduce style codes. Um, and those are sort of the data parallel features at a high level. So the last thing I have to tell you about is domain maps. And we saw these at the very beginning of the talk. Um, so again, when I run this code, uh, I haven't said anything about how my domain is implemented. And as a result, I'm going to use what's called the default layout. And that's going to target the current locale, just like any variable declaration by default targets the current locale. So I'm going to uh, store these indices and the arrays all using local memory. And when I do this parallel computation over them, again, I'm going to use a number of tasks equal to the number of hardware cores on the current locale. So if I run a four core machine, I'll chunk it into four pieces. Now, uh, the domain maps are basically useful for creating different mappings down to the hardware. So if I say dmapped cyclic, for example, uh, cyclic is parameterized by a start index, which says, where should I start dealing indices out? Uh, here I say start at 1. And so that's going to basically give me a round-robin partitioning of the 1D plane, 
which gives me a round robin partitioning of my domain and my arrays. And now when I do this parallel statement, I've got distributed memory parallelism. So each locale sort of owns now a fraction of the array. It's going to compute on its fraction of the array, and it's going to use multiple cores to chunk up the fraction of the array that it owns. Uh, and again, those will be distributed out in a round robin fashion. Now, if I didn't want to do a cyclic distribution, uh, let's say I wanted to do more of a blocking, I could switch out a different domain map. Like this says, use a block distribution. It's parameterized by a bounding box. It says, divide up this bounding box as evenly as possible across the locales. That gives me a chunking again of the 1D plane, uh, which chunks up my domains and chunks up my arrays. And here again, that's going to give me sort of full distributed memory parallelism, where if I'm on four compute nodes, I'd chunk up the arrays between those compute nodes, and then each uh, locale would uh, chunk up its portion across the cores that it owned, right? So this gets back to the very beginning of the talk I mentioned where sort of by changing that domain map, I can dramatically change the way I've mapped this computation down to the machine. And I've done it just by modifying a declaration rather than modifying all of the algorithm. And I don't have it in this talk, but we have some nice examples of kind of real scientific codes where all of the science is written in a way that's very independent of questions like, is it shared memory or distributed memory? Do I use a sparse array or a dense array? Um, you know, decisions that normally kind of ripple through your code vastly are sort of constrained to these small domain map clauses. All right, so I'm going to wrap up quickly here. Um, I start out saying Chapel is extensible, and uh, one of the ways in which it's extensible is that you can write these domain maps yourself. So if you have a way of laying out arrays in memory or distributing them across memories, and we haven't foreseen that uh, or gotten around to implementing it yet, you can write your own domain map which says, well, here's how I want to implement my arrays, and the compiler will target that as it's lowering these high-level data parallel sections um, down to tasks and, and locales. Uh, you can also write your own parallel loop schedules. So if you want to control the policy used by a for-all loop, for example, you can say how many tasks you should use, where they should run, how the iterations are divided between the tasks. And we mentioned in one of the questions, you can also write your own models of the target architecture. How do I run tasks on it? How do I uh, allocate memory on it? Um, and all these things can be written as Chapel code without any modifications to the compiler. Uh, and we think this is important because, you know, architectures are changing, people come up with new data distributions and algorithms all the time. We want to make sure that you can express those things in the language without having to go and learn how to change the compiler or change the language. Um, so if you think of Chapel as an R&D project, uh, which it is, uh, our main challenge has basically been this, like how do we make all of these things user specifiable in the language yet without completely tanking on performance? Um, and we worried about correctness first, so if you looked at Chapel two years ago, five years ago, ten years ago, uh, some of these features were running but the performance was abysmal. Uh, more and more as time goes on the performance is getting uh, on par with conventional techniques. So to summarize the language, um, I think parallel programmers, whether they work in HPC or mainstream computing or data analytics, deserve better programming models. We think that higher level models like Chapel can help insulate uh, algorithms from the parallel implementation details, giving each expert sort of the ability to focus on the piece of the code that they care about. And yet we can do this without completely giving up control, right? So we're not just saying, trust the compiler, we'll do everything right for you. Things like these domain maps give you this ability to say like, well, here's how I want to map that down to my architecture and here's how I want to parallelize things. Um, so we think that Chapel can greatly improve productivity, uh, both for current parallel architectures and emerging ones, and for HPC users as well as mainstream users. Uh, so in the last few minutes, I just want to, oh, right, I do have that section. Let me pause. And it, yeah, you want me to wrap it up. All right. No, keep going. Oh, keep going. I'm sorry. Um, let me just pause real quick because I've been kind of yammering for the last several slides. Any questions about the language before I talk about kind of meta issues? All right, and you're still with me. You're not wishing you'd stay down and watch Trump oh, or Hillary. <laughs> All right, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the project, and then I'll give you the pointers for, for future use. So at the beginning of the talk, I said Chapel's portable. Uh, you know, we're obviously working on it at Cray, and obviously it runs on Cray's, but it's not at all restricted to Cray's. We designed both the language and the implementation to be very hardware independent. So currently, to run the code, you need a C uh, and C++ compiler. Um, some sort of Unix-y kind of environment. And for those of you who work here locally at Microsoft, Windows used to be kind of the thing we agonized over not supporting. But my understanding is with the new bash support that people have been able to run Chapel on Windows natively. Um, prior to that, we used Sigwin, which, as you know, is sufficient but a little disappointing sometimes. Um, you need POSIX threads if you want to run anything in parallel. And you need some way of communicating if you want to run in distributed memory. But that way could be UDP. So in short, we basically run on pretty much any computer that you've probably used. 
um, laptops and worktops, commodity clusters, the cloud, um, certainly Craze and uh, other HPC systems from our esteemed competitors. And uh, recent focus, kind of going back to the what have we done in the last couple of years, has been again focusing on sort of emerging um, processor architectures like Intel Xeon Phi, um, GPUs, things like that. All right. Uh, so portable language, portable implementation. Chapel's open source. 99% uh, of the development is done on GitHub. There's a little bit of proprietary code for running on Cray's, um, but most people don't need that unless they're running on a Cray. Um, it's licensed as Apache 2.0 software, so it's a very permissive license. And uh, if you want to try it out, this is sort of the, the URL to start with, and I'll be making my slides available uh, for people to look at afterwards. You'll also find it with a Google search really easily. Um, this is our team at Cray uh, as of this past summer. There are 14 of us working on Chapel full time, like this is our whole job. Uh, we also in the summer have summer interns and sometimes visitors. We had a visiting professor this year. Uh, so there are a couple people missing in this picture, but um, you know, we've got a nice sized team working on it. Because it's open source, it's a collaborative effort. Uh, so I've got some logos here of various people that have uh, helped with it, either from a user perspective or from an implementation perspective. Uh, we'd be happy for, uh, there's not much local industry on here as you, as you might see. Uh, if Chapel's of interest to you in your job or as a hobby, uh, we'd love to have, you know, some Microsoft people, some Google people, some Intel people uh, on this slide as well. Uh, it's a work in progress. So, um, like a lot of languages, it's taken a long time to get to the point it's at now. Uh, for most of Chapel's history, I've said, try it out, give us your feedback, don't stake your project on it. Um, we're now getting to the point where for researchers or people who are writing code that's kind of try something out or try an idea quickly and throw it away, uh, more and more I think Chapel is actually ready for those kinds of uses. Um, if you're doing a 10-year project that your company depends on, probably we're not quite there yet, but hopefully in a couple more years. Uh, so at this point, we're sort of being picked up by early adopters. We've got about 3,000 downloads of the release per year, and we do two releases uh, per year. So you can think about, about 1,500 uh, downloads per release. Uh, most users who try it really like what they see. Um, very few people say like, oh, I just don't like this language. Uh, more often than not, the kinds of reactions you get are like, um, it's not performing well enough, which has historically been the case, and again, is getting better, uh, or um, you know, I want to know that there's a bigger community than just me, right? So there's a lot of kind of wallflowers waiting for there to be more momentum. But it's been years since anyone told me, like, yeah, this language just, it doesn't appeal to me, right? Uh, they're like, come back when, when, it's, when more people are using it or when it's performing better. Um, there's a YouTube video from, we run an annual workshop called Chew. Uh, there's a YouTube video from an astrophysicist at Yale who is one of these sort of early adopters and has followed Chapel for years and for years has said like, I'm going to like to use that someday. And sort of this year he's like, I think it's now ready that I can use it. It's got sort of sufficient features and performance that it's ready for me. So if you'd like to hear from someone who's not on the inside, from a user, um, his keynote's up on YouTube and it's a, it's a good talk. Uh, so most of the features are functional and working well. Pretty much everything you've heard about tonight uh, works as advertised. Um, ironically, most of the things that need improvement are in the base language because we are sprinting towards parallelism and distributed memory. And so like we never really developed an error handling story, uh, which of course is important. Um, so we're going back and filling that in now. We were also very naive about some of the object-oriented features like constructors. Uh, we sort of said, why does C++ have all these copy constructors and things? And then uh, at some point, it caught up with us. Um, so we're, <laughs> we're going back and uh, improving the constructors at this point. Uh, as I said, performance varies, but it's continually improving. Um, for shared memory execution, we tend to be very competitive with C and OpenMP these days. Uh, so for shared memory, I think we're, we're in a good spot. Um, distributed memory tends to be hit and miss, depending on what kinds of idioms you use. Um, there's also lots of ways you can shoot yourself in the foot, like always referring to that variable over on locale zero without realizing it. Um, so we're working on addressing the lacks here. All right, so here's the resources. Um, if you want to know more about Chapel, our main project page is chapel.cray.com. The GitHub repo is up there. We've got Facebook and Twitter if you use those things and want to follow us. Um, if you want to read one thing about Chapel after tonight, uh, there's a chapter in this book about Chapel, and it's kind of a good history of the language, some of the themes and some of the features you've seen tonight. It's sort of a good 30-page introduction, um, and it's available online, so you don't have to buy the book, although, of course, I encourage you to do so.
Um, if reading 30 pages is beyond your or your manager's uh, you know, ability to pay attention to anything these days, there are a number of blog articles here that I refer to, uh, which just give you sort of a taste of the language or what are we trying to do. Um, again, uh, these will be available online. And uh, there are a number of mailing lists, both announcement-based lists, where we send out broadcasts about new releases and things, a number of community lists uh, oriented towards users or developers or educators, um, and there are ways to contact us either by mail or on IRC or Stack Overflow. Um, so that's the core of my talk. Uh, I think I'll sort of officially end now. But again, if people would like to see like a hands-on demo, I'd be happy to do that. Um, the other thing I have, which the thing I alluded to as being hot off the presses, is we were originally um, accepted into the computer language benchmark game. If you're familiar with that, it's kind of a, a big shootout between a bunch of languages. Uh, getting accepted was a nice honor, because he basically says in his fact, like, I don't want to run your language. Um, so he actually acquiesced to running ours. And um, we've got some nice results, uh, some top entries in terms of performance and in terms of code compactness. Um, and so I have some graphs that kind of plot these things against one another that we were just sort of coming up with in the last 24 hours. But let me stop there uh, officially and see if there are any questions. Yeah? When did Chapel start and why is it called Chapel? Okay. So I'm going to answer the least embarrassing question first. So Chapel. Uh, Stands roughly okay. So it, it stemmed out of a, a government program called Cascade, and uh, or I should say that Cray's entry in the program was called Cascade. The government program was called High Productivity Computing Systems, and the goal of the program was to make supercomputers more productive. So the government basically said, you know, we're really really good at building faster and faster and faster and faster machines, but we're really terrible at getting more and more people able to make use of them. So the goal of the program was to make people 10 times more productive rather than simply making things faster. And Cray looked at a bunch of technologies from hardware to traditional software to tools to this new language, Chapel. And so the name Chapel comes from Cascade, which is the name of the program, High Productivity Language. And then we threw in some vowels, basically. <laughs> um, so that's where Chapel comes from. Uh, when did it start? I think, that, I think that the day that we said uh, we're going to do a language in this program was kind of like December of 2003. So it was a long time ago. But that was the day when we were like, OK, we're going to do language. What are we going to do? Right? So there was a lot of time with like, what's going to be in the language or not be in the language. And I would say we really got traction with language in terms of like, OK, this is what we're going to build, probably in the, around 2006 or so, which is still a very long time ago. And that's why I say it's embarrassing. Like Nobody likes to be thought of as a language that takes forever. But in fact, if you look at any of the sort of major significant languages, you know, like Python, for example, right? Somebody asked me, when did Python come about? I'm like, uh, you know, late 90s, early 2000s. Like, that's when I sort of started to become aware of it. But, you know, it started in the 80s, as I understand it. So others probably know better than I do. Um, so, you know, I wish I could say we started three years ago. Uh, but on the other hand, if you're hearing about it for the first time tonight, uh, you're hearing about it at a point where I'm, we're not as embarrassed about it as we would have been three years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago. Right? It took a long time to get to this point. Uh, the other thing I should say is, for a lot of that period of time, we were a small, scrappy, like five-person kind of research team, for lack of a better term. And it was about uh, three years ago now that Cray said, like, you know, the users seem to really like this. We're going to double down on this. And so that's kind of when we got to this team of 14. And it's also when we sort of stopped kind of splashing around and pursuing things and like, OK, let's lock down this language and get it working well. Um, so there's, if you look at sort of you know, performance or features or things like that, there's kind of this steep knee in the curve uh, that took place about three years ago when we switched into this new mode. Um, we've got a couple more years in that program, at which point you know, we'll decide, do we do more, or have we you know, not made enough of an impact? And so far, things seem to be trending that more and more people seem to like it. Performance is getting better. I feel good about the future. Other questions? All right.